Testing, check, 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 mic check. I didn't think that we would have this many people. Thank you for coming. I think you guys are here to check your email, that's fine. I understand. <laughs> I do that too. So welcome everyone. Uh, thanks, th thanks for, thanks all for coming. I'd like to welcome two more red hatters, Rashid Khan and Hannes Sowa, who are going to answer the "What's the big deal about networking?" questions for us. Rashid, go ahead. Thank you, sir. So welcome everybody. Thanks for coming, really appreciate it. Um, I know there's a lot of talks, a lot of good talks happening right now. So I'm glad that you guys are here, thank you. So um, these are not made up numbers. There's a site called Internet Live Stats. So whenever we give numbers to engineers, they try to find out that how bogus they are. So most probably they are bogus and they're a little bit right or correct, I don't know how they do it, but you can, you're welcome to check them out and figure, uh, see if they are um, real or not. But I found it interesting and that's why I put them up there while we were waiting. Anywho, so what's the big deal about networking? Uh, before I even begin on purpose, I did not put my name on these slides. Um, all the work that I'm gonna show is done by a very stellar team of engineers, uh, part of the networking services team and part of the performance team. So I honestly do not deserve any credit for any of this. I just drew some rectangles on some slides. All the good work, seriously, I'm not joking. I'm just here for my dashing good looks, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> okay, so networking, as we know, cloud computing, we heard a lot, but cloud needs to be tethered to the ground or to be tied to the ground because it needs the packets to go. So I tell people that cloud is great by itself, but cloud also needs a wire somehow, and that wire, that's what we put on. That's the transport that we have. So that's again the live stats when I took a snapshot, it was 1.6 billion gigabytes. So notice the last two alphabets is gigabytes. So that's how many gigabytes had transferred over the World Wide Web that day, and it was in the middle of the day, US time. That's a very large number, you know? That's a very large number, this is not so let's just have it sink in a little bit. 
So <clears throat> if you dislike the spinning wheel of loading, you know, like you go to a website or something and you have that spinning wheel that says loading, if you don't like that, or if you are waiting for anything more than a second, like you swipe a finger on a Facebook picture or Twitter and it takes more than one second, or if you like Facebook, YouTube, Snapchat, Uber, WhatsApp, etc., cetera, uh, then you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's not uh, me taking all the credit. It's all the silent players in the background working on networking, which is quite complicated, making it, all of that happens. We have started to take it for granted that we swipe a finger left or right and a picture appears, which is many, many megabytes. But there is billions and billions of uh, packets that flow in the background. So there is a silent army of engineers taking care of it for you of all kinds. So networking is getting more and more complex. It started with kernel networking, then we put some stuff in the user space and let the user space guy play with it, but we controlled it all. But since then, like then we knew TCP, UDP, new protocols, MACSEC, uh, service function chaining, bonding, uh, bridges. Jerry Perko is asking where is team? Yeah, there you go, team driver, see? <laughs> so, all kinds of different stuff, open vSwitch, Megaflows, DNS, you name it, it's all kinds of stuff happening. In the other talk, we talked about some of them, uh, Dan Winship brought it up, Geneve. It's, if I name it all, the slide would be full and you would be bored. The idea is that it is behind in the user space networking and in the kernel space networking, there's just oodles and oodles of stuff. It's my job, really, literally, full-time job to keep track of it, and I cannot anymore. Seriously, I cannot. It's just so much happens every few months. It's just an unbelievable amount of change. In one of the talks, before we, I go on, in one of the other talks, I hear that the networking has changed more in the last couple of years than it had changed in the last 26 years. And I, I absolutely believe it. So, um, yeah, please, welcome. So, so if, again, to illustrate the point about complexity, this is an OpenStack instance within one host. So you're saying, Rajit, I, I can't read this. This is too, uh, this is like an eye doctor's chart. Yes, absolutely, it's by design. So what we wanted, I wanted to show was that this is the zoom in view of that. There is bonds, VLANs, bridges, uh, OBS tunnels, etc. so much stuff that is just in one node. So this all thing is an actual customer deployment from OpenStack within one node. Um, and it's just, it needs a PhD just to be able to set this stuff up. We are trying, so I'm encouraging people to go for their PhDs and definitely networking, but at the same time, we are trying to simplify it for you as well. So another thing that is happening is, so complexity um, is one aspect, and then I'll talk more about that, but how many people remember the dial-up modem? Oh wow, I thought it would be like few people like me, old, old geezers would hold their hand. You guys are millennia. Yeah, there's the sound. We all hated it, right? We all hated it. It still like puts my, my back, the hair in the back of my neck went up. So why did I put this up? Why, do, why am I unearthing ancient history? The reason quite simply is the cable modem changed the telephony industry, the telephone system infrastructure before the cable modem or the telephone modem or the VoIP, uh, yeah, um, dial-up modem. Before the dial-up modem, it was the telephony system was designed for a two and a half minute call. That's it. But when the dial-up modems came up, people were going online for hours and staying online and the systems were crashing and they couldn't keep up. The telephone system was not designed for that. It was choking. So they came up with this thing called internet offload at that time. I was one of the lucky engineers who came out of the college when this was happening, so I was part of that revolution. We were part of a startup, made some good money, and we all remember those good days. And then voice over IP happened, et cetera, et cetera. So the old model was commodity hardware and commodity software. I was part of a big giant German company, not Volkswagen, but, uh, <laughs> uh, and, we, we really built a 320 euro gateway, 320 million euro gate, gateway. And that was completely proprietary to take care of voice over IP, internet offload, etc. So that's the amount of money it was going to take to do the internet offloading. 
nobody can afford to spend 320 million euros on telephony anymore. It's getting cheaper and cheaper, all the services are getting cheaper, etc. So what is the new trend? What is happening is this is a new revolution that's happening. That's open source hardware, like commodity hardware, Dell servers, HP servers, whatever kind of servers, and open source software. Because there's no way we can compete on a new, there's no features that can help the network equipment providers make money. They want to reduce money. Everything is about reducing money. So all the cloud stuff, all the things we talked about, etc. everything needs three things. One is CPU, one is networking, and one is storage. So Tom is sitting here, he'll, vote for, he'll say that the storage should be the middle piece, or if Linda was here, she would say that the CPU should be the middle piece, but of course, I made the slide, so the networking is the middle piece of the leg, or the middle leg. So, but on top of this stable system, this is like the stable system that is needed on top of that, there is software layer upon software layer upon software layer. There's just layers and layers of software, and the complexity is increasing. So what is happening is the poor CPU which is this tiny truck has all that stuff happening on top of it. And it's an overloaded and the axle is breaking and it's breaking apart, etc. So we have to have a solution for this. What are the solutions? We'll talk about it a little bit later. But I just want to make you realize that having commodity, I mean, open source software is one thing, but the layers of software that is needed to go all the way to the cloud is just mushrooming. So sports car. So changing track a little bit, I know I'm jumping, time is running short, anyhow. So sports car, if somebody was to design a sports car, what do we need? Oh, we need it to be buzz, we need it to be sexy, we need it fast, we need it to be fun to drive, and we need it cool. Boom, there's your sports car. It's a Porsche, wow, excellent. But then somebody like me gets it, his two children, and skiing, and golf, and children's backpacks, etc., and has to work. So. By the way, why did I put this, this game out of order? Anyhow, the sports car is the DPDK. It's fast, it's buzz, it does a lot of stuff. Um, it gets the package to the user space super fast, but it does not do a whole bunch of stuff. So now coming back to your car analogy. Now if my wife say, oh, it should carry the luggage. Oh, okay. It should have four doors. Okay, fine. It should be easy in and out. It should work on all seasons, like dirt, road, snow, sand, whatever. Um, and it should have low emissions and f low emissions and fuel efficiency. Okay, fine. So what happens? There you go. You end up with a sedan. It does a whole bunch of stuff. Might not be as cool. Uh, might have other problems. But that's our old, sorry to say old, but that's our kernel networking or net dev that we knew about. So new stuff is coming, but still, guess what? The sedan is still there. The net dev kernel is still very relevant, and we'll talk about that. So the kernel networking is listed on the left-hand side um, from the IP cloud. Uh, it goes to the NIC driver, goes to kernel networking, crosses the user space boundary, goes to open vSwitch, and uh, uh, goes to the vhost net, QEMU, and goes to different virtual machines or goes to the different containers. Um, the picture pretty much remains the same. This, these pictures are simplified. Uh, for a reason, just to illustrate the point. I know there's so much more complexity to this, but I simplified it just to show you a good, cheap example. Then the middle, middle column is the DPDK plus vhost user. So that is another model in which DPDK takes the packet directly from the cloud, shunts it to the user space, and guess what? Everything else is in the user space. Boom. No more kernel, no nothing, no packets or, yeah, no packets going through the kernel networking. No problem, okay, happens, it's okay. Then the third one is device assignment, SRIOV. Uh, Dan mentioned it in his talk, I think there are other talks, been there, done that. Direct assignment, packets again, going directly to the virtual machines. So why should a user or anybody pick one or the other? So there are pros and cons, as usual. So on the left-hand side with the kernel networking, you have all the pros, feature risk, feature rich, 26 years of development, open source, all, everything you can imagine is there. On the DPTK side, packets fly directly to user space. The user space guys take all the control. They do everything. But there are still some cons. It has, it has limited offloading support. The TCP stack is not there. There is work in progress for migration, etc. And device assignment also has pros and cons. 
You can read this offline. I'm not going to bore you with by line by line items, but there are pros and cons of everything as in, as in life. The good thing about Red Hat or the Red Hat solution is that the way I view it is that we offer a buffet. You know, like you go to a restaurant and there's a buffet. You can pick and choose what you want. So all these three options are available for our customers and partners to use, and we will support them till the cows come home, as they say. We'll support them day in, day out. So DPDK is fully integrated. DPDK plus OVS is fully integrated. OVS without DPDK is integrated. OVS with kernel networking. All of this is available. Now, coming back to the pros and cons. So ultimately, Rajat, what, what is the packet rate? What is the throughput rate? OK, fine. Our stellar performance team has been doing a phenomenal job getting us the uh, results that we need. So as you see, from the left hand side, I'm just going to compare the two because it was getting too complicated to have SRIV in there. But I, we have those data. We have that data as well. So on the left hand side, uh, by the way, this is before I start. This is a 64 byte frame. And the theoretical limit on this on a 10 gig link is 14.88. So just to give you a reference. I put that in the bottom of every slide. So the theoretical limit is there. So for ultra low 64 byte packets on the kernel networking side with layer 3 routing with the recent work that went in for 7.2 and upstream Alex Dyke did a tremendous job at it we are at the almost the theoretical limit you know 14.88 versus 14.12 no problem layer 3 routing solved then again uh, we move up to up to OVS we are at 9.05 and then crossing that boundary into vhost net we are really dismal. The performance goes down tremendously. No problems. We are working on it. It's not the end of the world. We can solve that problem. We talked about it yesterday. It's there. We have plans to solve that, hopefully. Um, <laughs> this mic is really good, man. <laughs> I have to note myself. Honest, be careful. <laughs> so on the DPDK side, all the way to OVS, it's reach the theoretical limit, no problem. When you go to the virtual machines, again, performance goes down, 4.21. It's a tremendous loss in performance. But hold that thought. I will cover that again. Now, some people might argue that 64-byte um, frames was not realistic. 256 might be OK. OK, fine, no problem. We have that data as well. Now, the things look, start to look better. Why do they look better? Because if in a tiny frame you're doing an overhead, Allah, there's a lot of overhead of pushing the packets. There's no batching, there's no nothing, etc. Many different reasons. So now with 60, 256 bytes, the data looks okay. But that 0.77 number is still pretty bad. But the theoretical limit on this size of packet is 4.53. Um, both on the OVS side, with or without uh, DPDK, we are okay all the way to open vSwitch. But the vhost boundary when you go to virtual machines, the 256 is better. OK, we are working on it, no problem. Then we go to 512. The numbers, again, become better. The gap is closing with or without DPDK, no problem. Things look good. And then I'll rush forward and go to a typical size, MTU size, which is more typical in, in a realistic environment. And now the numbers are very, very similar. So just a point to note again, these are the, I wrote down the theoretical limit at the bottom. And as you can see on the MTU size, which is 1500 bytes, it all makes sense. All the numbers are at theoretical limit. So job well done, let's go home. No, 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 it's not done. We are still have a lot of work to do. What do are we doing? So why is that uh, this one? So going back to this one for a second, see that 4.21 number? Why is that performance so bad? Why is, why is it that when we cross the vhost user boundary, there's a tremendous loss? Yep, we can explain that. So that's because the vhost user, all those packets are going through a single queue. And there might be many different CPUs which are idle, but one CPU is pegged all the way to the sky, and it's crunching all the numbers, and that is the max it can do on a x86 server. So how do we solve this? You will say, Rashid, very easy. We have multiple queues. Yeah, voila, there you go. We have multiple queues. It's called, it is vhost user with multiple queues so that you can open up many different CPUs to do the number crunching or the packet pushing or the packet transfer. 
So no big deal, we can do that easily and now we are again close to the theoretical limit. It's no problem and we are working with our partners in Niceria, VMware, Intel to make this number go higher as well. So we are constantly trying to improve the performance of the system. It's part of our mantra, part of our charter. We lose sleep at night trying to push the packets forward to virtual machines, open stack, you name it, all the way to the containers. That's where our, we are earning our bread and butter these days. Okay, so coming back to this for a second. So you say, Rashid, that's not really good because now if you are a big bank and you bought a gigantic system and you're going to write the next killer app, you're going to write the next Facebook or the next Google or next whatever um, app, and all of a sudden you're taking four of my cores just for packing, pushing packets to virtual machines. That's not fair. What am I going to do with the rest? If I have an eight core system, you're taking four of them. Yeah, that's a problem. So, and it's, it's, I can, it's an understandable problem that you are using so much CPU power just for packet pushing. Where am I going to do the app? Where am I going to run my Java, JavaScripts, all of that stuff? So, they always need all the CPU. Anyhow, so there, that's our solution. That is what we are working on. One of our friends, Jiri Perko, he came up with this concept called SwitchDev. Um, he has been working on it for a while. What it's going to do is it's going to enable hardware offloading. So instead of all the work being done on the main CPU, we're going to offload it to the different NICs, which will help a lot. And we are working with our partners. There are some partners who already have solutions. We are going to start working with them to make this happen. Like they have it working, now we are work going to Red, Red Hat, we are going to work with them to make it part of our Red Hat distribution. So this is already in the works. Hopefully when I go back to Westford, patches will be available, we can run with it. And uh, Jiri Purko is sitting there smiling, saying, no way, man. <laughs> so um, nothing but net. It's a, it's, it is a basketball reference for people who might not understand it. Nothing but net means like you hit the basketball, you threw the basketball, it went swish in, and um, there was, it didn't hit the rim, it just went directly two points. So nothing but net, we are NFV ready. So NFV is the big push. There's trillions and trillions of dollars, gazillions of dollars to be made in that place. Um, and that is the big push for OpenStack. Even some people are saying every phone call is going to be a container. Some people are saying every app, everything is going to be on a virtual machine. There's all kinds of grandiose ideas. Fine, no problem. We are a NFE ready. We have the building blocks ready. Their packets are being pushed at theoretical limits. I already told you about it in the previous slides. And now some people are skeptical that, okay, OpenStack, yeah, it's big, it's bulky, what am I going to do about it, etc. But there are actual operators, networking operators, who are coming to us and saying, we are going to use OpenStack, we are going to use RHEL, we are going to use DPDK, and these are the things that we need from you. So it's not that we are trying to push it. The network equipment manufacturers, or NEPs, network equipment providers, are coming to us and saying, this is what we need. And they are really making a big deal out of it. I have a quote from uh, uh, South Korea Telecom. It's called SK Telecom. I used to work a lot with uh, our Korean customers and partners in my previous life. They are the most conservative people. They will never tell you what they have in plans unless they have it done. So this is their, so they, they, there's a guy, I forget, he was VP of NFV development, etc. He's on YouTube, you can watch it yourself. He was saying that as part of their 5G deployment or their 5G plans beyond, they will have software defined networking, they will have NFV, OpenStack, it's centerpiece. It's, it is what is being used for all their next gen stuff. And if we consider that we are already in 2016 and they are planned to deploy it in 2020, that means that the field trials are going to start now or are starting. And yes, that is true. We have actual field trials starting with all of this stuff now, all the way with OpenStack, OpenShift, containers in a virtual machine, you name it. So you'll say, hey Rashid, what about why you mentioned so much about virtual machine, you didn't say anything about containers. Well, no problem. 
So here's a slide for containers. There's a whole track of talks about containers, containers networking. Dan Winship already did one. If you missed it, it was a very, very good talk. It gives an overview. I highly recommend that you watch it. There's going to be another one by Rajat sitting in the corner later on this in this room. But I wanted to give you a simple view about the container side. The good thing about all of this is before I even begin is that the containers, we don't see the performance problems. Containers are designed with a very simple network. You pop one open and it comes with an IP address 192.168. Very simple. No problem. You, you have a container. Voila. The problem comes when the, that container has to talk with other stuff. So on a laptop, popping open a container, no problem. You don't need anything. It has a tap device outside. It can talk to the World Wide Web. No issues. Thanks, Anas. <laughs> I thought I ran out of time, so it was a warning or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. ah. so, so in containers, this picture is much simpler. But the simple networking of the containers, as you see the 192.168 address, that still has to connect with that big giant ball of networking or big giant Godzilla of networking that has been created for the last 26 years. And we have a solution. It does connect. It does connect. It does work. Host to host, node to node, pod to pod, namespaces, you name it. Throw all the layers of isolation, migration, you name it, on it, multi-tenancy, it all works. We have it working. We have it deployed. OpenShift is sh uh, shipping with live, OpenShift Live right now. And we have tested it with thousands and thousands of nodes already. Um, and it does scale, uh, doesn't seem to be any problems. So that's pretty good. But if you are interested more in containers networking talks, please stay in this room. And we'll tell you more about it. So with that said, I'll shift it over to my esteemed colleague, Hannes. He's going to tell you about uh, what is, you have another one. Oh, OK, that's fine. I can also just use the. So he's going to tell you more about what we have in the pipeline, what we are working on, and uh, how maybe you can help us. Yeah, hello, my name is Hannes. Um, I'm part of Rashid's team. And a short introduction, what we are looking for in the next few, uh, in this year, next few months, and also maybe next few years, what will come up. So our daily button, uh, um, butter and bread job is like, we, we have to care about the rail networking stack, which basically means everything what pushes packets in and out. Um, we need to, to fix stuff not only in rail, but also very often upstream. So we need to look ahead and also care about what, what rail 8 will look like. So uh, even so, we can't push everything into, well, into Red Hat Linux, we, we need to make sure that at the point when we try to work on RHEL 8, we have a networking stack which we can use on. So um, we try to, to uh, work with the upstream community to, to fix bugs early and as fast as possible. Um, a little bit on, my, on, my, on our agenda is like we want to look into security in the cloud more. So. Um, Sabrina um, in our team developed the MagSec implementation, which we now try to push upstream. Um, we will have to work further on it to also like specify how crypto keys can get negotiated, even with um, if you use it in the cloud, like not only on the um, Ethernet layer, which will be um, solved quite easily, but if you also do that in tunnels. Then there are some kind of pro um, proposals for Vixlan crypto, so you can actually encrypt the VXLAN tunnel themselves. And people also look into IPsec, IPsec offloading. So you actually can do the crypto processes on the networking card. So um, the networking card basically gives you the unencrypted packet and verified packet already. The problem here in Linux is like we have like all those offloads, but sometimes it's very hard to actually make use of them because uh, the offloading extension sometimes makes use of... Um, the floating point unit, and it's sometimes hard to get that into in the receive pass because um, it's only used, actually designed to use in, in user space. So we are looking also in performance enhancements there. A uh, big thing always is, is performance. So performance is like, I would divide it into two categories. We always have like the software performance, which is like we need to improve or we, we look into how to improve um, 
the software code and then there's always the possibility if the software cannot keep up with what networking wants to do, the idea to, to push stuff into the hardware and just let the hardware do it and the software um, tries to come up or tries some kind of sane configuration, tries to provide some sane configuration interface um, down to the hardware. So we have, for example, switch dev, which tries to have a common interface, a generic interface, how to configure switches in, in the Linux kernel. So it doesn't really matter which switch you use. You can transparently use all kinds of switches. Um, and this then can get integrated furthermore into the whole stack. Like, for example, it should be possible that Open vSwitch can then, for example, offload complete flows to the, um, to the hardware, or the bridge can pre-establish flows which directly go through the hardware and won't ever touch the software stack. Um, com problems in there is like, of, in, in a lot of cases, we need to have some kind of fallback path to software, um, through software. And there it is important that we actually synchronize all those um, hardware and software slow paths um, in a way that they don't actually break stuff. So the hardware and the software needs to work very, very, uh, they need to have the same properties and they need to work, um, yeah, the same. They would, it doesn't, it should not matter where the packet gets processed, basically. Um, so on the software side, what we, uh, what was seen last year, and we try now to also get back into Red Hat, is like we have seen lots of TCP and, and socket enhancements. So uh, one of the bigger projects is that the TCP listener log was removed upstream, which now provides kernels in, in, uh, which make heavy use of TCP servers with a much better um, um, capability to scale up to um, concurrently receiving lots of more, lots more connections. That was done mostly by Eric Dumasé at Google. Um, also, like small patches finally hit the tree. So, for example, there is no way for like the thundering heart problem in EPOL. Um, to finally make sure that, for example, if you get um, a SYN packet into a socket and you are e-polling or polling on the socket, that only one um, thread gets woken up and not all threads which are using this, um, uh, this listening socket. So that is actually uh, helping a lot in, in a lot of scenarios. It was contributed by Akamai. Um, there are more of, of small enhancements which we try to or API enhancements we also try to, to put into the kernel or then later on backport to make more scalable software possible in user space. Um, the XMIT more enhancements which were like pushed last year need now to make, uh, then it's now a way that we actually make more use of them. XMIT more is a way that we actually um, bundle packets so we don't just process one packet when we receive it from the networking card but we bundle packets and try to steer packets through the networking stack um, at the same time that helps CPUs that, um, so they can make more better use of the instruction caches um, and also provides us with caching probabilities so that we for example can, can do one routing lookup look up, and if we see like the second packet has the same destination IP address, the same incoming interface, we can just use that same routing lookup for the second packet and so on. So we, we try to, to do more caching memoriz memorization tricks there. Um, and Jesper is also working like on better memory allocation strategies. They are basically also like in the direction we try to, to steer more packets on the CPUs. I have a per CPU allocator batch then the memory allocations and try to process as much as packets as possible on the same CPU so we can like have better CPU cache um, utilization and usage. Um, on the hardware side, like um, I'm actually not sure how where this is going. So what we see right now is that um, SwitchDev and OVS will might become friends and um, that we finally see some way that, that hardware can offload more and um, more and more from what the user space currently configures to the kernel. Um, yeah, basically, we will see if this will be realized. I don't know yet. Um, eBPF and perf enhancements are probably happening this year. So Facebook is currently pushing a lot of um, money in developing um, introspection or observability features, especially for TCP right now, and the first tools are actually now available upstream in the recent um, Linux kernel, so you can now use um, eBPF 
code actually and add them to specific um, perf points to collect data, like you can build aggregations in, inside the kernel. Before that, it was only possible to like export on a hit of a probe every data to user space and then do the aggregation there. And that was difficult because like it could, you could easily um, export like gigabytes of perf performance data. And now you can do that in the kernel. The kernel just pumps up an, uh, an integer. Yeah, and then discussions about protocol generic offloading. So every one of you can design their own tunneling protocols, which is pretty cool. Um, then a big point probably this year will be that there's a lot of um, um, complexity nowadays in the kernel, how to correctly configure that. And so for example, Fedora already or Reddit already provides like Tune, which is an uh, user space scripting solution, which helps people to actually tune the kernel correctly. And we will need to push more and more options into tune so the kernel after installation actually behaves like in a performant way for specific installations, like what you want to have. Um, that's ex especially um, important for those layered products like uh, OpenStack and OpenShift, where currently like default configurations are often very used and those don't provide the best performance actually. Um, yeah, so in hopefully stuff should work better out of the box and doesn't need that much uh, hand configuration in future. Um, so from from the specification side, what might come up, I don't think it will be ready this year. Is like the, uh, uh, um, there will be much more flexibility also in the in the in the data pass, like how to describe flows and how what actions actually to take. So we will see like uh, maybe programming languages like P4 where you can specify how to actually match packets um, being integrated in OVS at some point with the help of this eBPF language that could happen and also like more more and more possibilities of what you do, uh, what you can do in actions. So one, one uh, thing for example is like um, um, in service function chaining, you are now able to actually put metadata on packets, which then another OVS instance can read again and can act up, can act up on that. So you can actually, switches can communicate over metadata in packets via to each, each other, and people can build things out of that as building blocks. Um, other things which will definitely come up this year is like Internet of Things. So... Um, Linux currently supports like two protocols mostly. The one is um, Six Low Palm, which is like uh, IPv6 based um, protocol, which is built for um, networks which transmit on a very low um, band uh, with very low bandwidth. So they do have specific features, like for example, don't provide like the same kind of neighbor discovery, but are very complex reduced ones. They have IPv6 um, address compression and things like that. And um, Linux already supports it over the IEEE 802.15.4 standard, which is also used as Zigbee. And on the other side, we have like Bluetooth Low Energy, which also might be used in the Internet of Things world quite a lot. Um, they are preparing for with a lot of profiles where we have basic kernel support already, but lots of profiles will need to be added like for specific applications. So you will find uh, uh, profiles for like those health devices, which specifically like monitor your heart rate and stuff like that. Um, another thing we actually decided to look into again is like um, Wi-Fi performance. So with the recent advance of 811 AC, like gigabit speeds now, on Wi-Fi and that even going up, we would also need to check that the Linux kernel can in future handle those speeds. Some of the wireless drivers are already very, very complex, um, but actually don't implement all those features we have implemented in the high-end data center NICs which you use in the data center. So we might look um, after some of the Wi-Fi drivers and also check if we now can actually use those features, for example, in Wi-Fi. I think that's enough that's for good. this year, hopefully. We are on time. <laughs> um, so if you have any questions for Rashid yep. or myself, yep. we're we'll happy to answer them. I have one slide left. Oh, That's okay. You have the mic. So, sure. so please join us. You know, 
if you are in this room, that means that you are at least made the first step of trying to figure out what the heck is networking and what we are doing. We, I guarantee you, it's the fastest path to become a celebrity rock star upstream and in rel. <laughs> Tim Burke had a keynote about this morning about being a rock star. Yeah, absolutely. This is, this is a place where not many souls have endeavored. And if you think that packet movement is something that excites you, join us. We, we would love to have you help. We have openings in our team. It's a shameless plug for... Yeah. But you also hire trolls. Yes. <laughs> yeah, anybody. And I guarantee you one thing. So I, like when I do an interview or phone screen or someone, they say, oh, what will I be working on? Say, I can tell you what you'll be working on in the next three to six months. But beyond that, if I told you anything, I would be lying. Because the reason is honestly, every three to six months, it changes tremendously, seriously. In the last week even, even before after we came back from the holidays, this, my world shifted 90 degrees. And I had to foc we all had to focus on different things. Things come out of the woodwork, we have to adjust. It's really interesting stuff that we are working on. So please join us. Um, there are other networking talks, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Please listen to those and give us feedback. Uh, give feedback for the other talks as well. Uh, another thing which I just want to mention is like, we also, Florian does amazing work in the NFT world. So replacing the old IP table stuff where, I don't know if people remember like the diploma thesis about HyPEC NG, where they try to algorithmically advance IP tables to be really, really fast. And that is kind of happening now with NFT. So if people want to now actually reduce like 16,000 rules of IP tables into four, they should definitely look at in an NFT. And Florian, please make that happen. <laughs> Absolutely. Questions? Comments? There's a nice car fare for you for questions. Bribe? No? It cannot be that I explained everything so well that you don't have questions. That means that you were checking your email. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fine. We should. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, please feel free to ask us questions on the side, etc. There are other networking talks, as I said. And thank you very much for coming. <laughs>